decolonization, restorative solidarity, Sabbath economics, watershed discipleship, bioregional sustainability, and social transformation. And for seven years, uh, we have been focusing on the roots of injustice here, settler colonialism in the United States. And we are keenly aware that the patterns of settler colonialism forged in the United States have fundamentally shaped what is happening um, in Israel-Palestine right now by Israeli settlers in Palestine. So again, welcome. We are so grateful um, uh, to, to be here and to be learning uh, and conversing with Kiki. Thanks, Elaine. And um, for those of you who are just joining us, and I just remember to turn on the recording. So my name is Tim Nafziger, pronouns are he, him, here on traditional Shumash land. And I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Linda Kikivish, or Kiki, as many of us know her. Um, Kiki, uh, I've known for, I think since 2016 or 2017, organizing here in Ventura County. Um, Kiki has a doctorate in geography from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill a certificate in Middle East studies from Duke right, University. So you want to and um, I'm using mom's phone. Or, and or, do you want to do that? Do the, uh, no. Sorry, just one second. And um, Andrew Mellon, postdoctoral fellowship in critical global humanities at Brown University. She is the author of the forthcoming Palestine 1492 book published by uh, Community and Autonomous Press. This evening, we'll be hearing a lot of, of the content from that book. Um, and that'll be coming out in February. And on a personal note, uh, Kiki also does great popular education. I've gotten to participate in her book studies here in Ventura County, where we sit around and read books together and talk about them. And she's that's one of her passions and gifts that we'll be um, learning from this evening. So uh, without further ado, Kiki, uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I wonder if I might get um, sharing rights, share screen rights. I... Yes, I will do that right now. Thank you. And just while we do that, um, just as a brief background, a personal autobiography about myself, <laughs> obviously, this, this whole um, project of mine about Palestine and maps started from my... Um, obsession over borders, over the U.S.-Mexico border, over the Guatemala-Mexico border, which my family had to cross. And so when I when I learned about Rafah crossing in particular, the border between Gaza and Egypt, um, I couldn't stop looking that way. I couldn't stop learning more about it. And it, it told me a lot more about the world. And I think that's why I... I wanted to learn so much because I was learning a lot more than just about Palestine, Israel. I was also learning about the world. So a lot of my work shares that process and that learning. So when I bring up 1492 together with Palestine, that's usually an odd combination because a lot of the time, the story between uh, Israel and Palestine begins in the 19th century when Jews from Europe were fleeing anti-Semitism to create a homeland in Palestine. But I bring it back to 1492 to also allow us to talk about how this, even though it's very a unique situation with its specificities, it's also a shared logic and practice that has been going on in the world. And I think that that can help us try to better understand what's happening so that we might better create another world. So I will share my screen now, let's see. And I wonder if you can see that okay? Marcos is gay? Yes. So I just wanna begin with this early communique from the Zapatista Army for National Liberation in 1994. And it was just a communique where people were trying to figure out who Marcos is and the, the adversaries were calling him gay as if that was going to be an insult. And they shot back and said, yes, actually Marcos is gay. Gay in San Francisco, black in South Africa, Asian in Europe, Chicano in San Isidro, anarchist in Spain, and continues on and notice that most of the time they bring up the context <laughs> and they're bringing up those who are in struggle, who are in- Male, female. 
but in a specific context. So we'll come back to that. I really want to start here, though, in this um, with this world map. This is a European map of the world. It was published in 1581. It's very um, medieval and modern at the same time in that it's medieval in that it, it highlights three continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, with Jerusalem in the center as the center of the world. It also has the sea creatures, the mermen, the mermaids, to talk about, to, you know, to show, to signal what areas are scary, which areas are exotic, Indian Ocean is exotic, and Africa and America are exotic. You notice America is there over in the corner because the they didn't, this was not in their cosmovision that we existed over here. So, you know, they, they put it over in the corner, not really knowing what to do with it. But after, after this, maps become very different. But what's important about this one is that it shows from the European geographical imagination, the importance of Palestine, the importance of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, it also then shows a transition moment where the discovery of the Americas really shifts the cosmovision of the Europeans. So, so the next a more contemporary map of Jerusalem, now this is a map of the proposed state of Palestine in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank with Jerusalem as its capital. And what it is, is showing is mostly the capitals of countries in, in about the same font. So it shows almost equal importance to East Jerusalem, to Amman and to Tel Aviv. And so it doesn't seem so sacred anymore. And a lot of the maps that, are, that have been used in the peace process between Israelis and Palestinians look like this. And there's a lot of talk about land swaps as if swapping Jerusalem out for another land is, you know, is, is equal. So when we, when we have one way of mapping like this and it's dominant, we lose a lot of the other ways of understanding geography, like sacred geography of that previous map, for example. I wanna also show then uh, this map, which is the Iberian Peninsula. Since we're starting in 1492, we're, we're starting not at October 12th. We're starting at January 2nd to tell this story. January 2nd was the surrender of Granada, the last Muslim stronghold in the Iberian Peninsula after centuries of battle and ethnic cleansing, sadly, where the Catholic monarchs ethnically cleansed the Iberian Peninsula of Islam and immediately amped up the Inquisition against Jews in Spain. And so January 2nd, 1492 was enormous news, especially because the uh, Ottoman Empire had just taken Constantinople a few decades before in 1453. So uh, that Islam was growing over on the East and was now shrinking because of battle, because of a holy war against it over on the West and the Iberian Peninsula was momentous and even more so than October 12th would be of that same year. And so when you go to Spain, you see that when they have monuments to 1492, they have both dates, January 2nd and October 12th. And I was able to go to Granada and Madrid uh, when the Zapatistas went in 2021. And while I was in Granada, I right in front of the Alhambra, I came across a sandwich board sign in the old city uh, recruiting me to go into the an exhibit, the Inquisition's uh, Ancient Instruments of Torture. Um, and I went and I learned a lot about Europe that I hadn't heard that much before. And in particular, that a lot of these atrocities that the conquistadors um, inflicted on us, such as waterboarding, such as an Inquisition, for example, when they... they uh, forced everyone to convert to Catholicism. They had an inquisition here as well. Also the burning of books. They had burned other people's books before they burned our books. So there was this in 1492, a lot of scholars understand that to be the moment of the birth of modern Europe. Some scholars think maybe it was 1453 when the Ottoman Empire 
well, when the Byzantine Empire fell, uh, the Roman Empire. And what, we, what really it is, it's, it's a rupture that allows an opening for other things to happen. So in Granada, Columbus was there as Granada was surrendering and uh, waited very patiently until Isabella, Queen Isabella, the Catholic monarch, was done taking Granada to, to uh, talk to her about sailing west. And something that isn't discussed a lot is that he wanted to, he, he wanted to take Jerusalem next. And that was their conversation that had been in his diaries. And a lot of the time we don't hear about that part. We hear about Columbus wanting to be rich, which happened of course with, um, well not Columbus himself, but the conquistadors. There are so many reasons why people went and one of them was um, as a continuation of this holy war, where what happened in the Iberian Peninsula with the winds, with the victories of the Catholic monarchs, was that difference was not allowed. No one could be Muslim anymore. Eventually, no one was allowed to be Jewish. Everyone had to be one way. And that imposition of one world on everyone that took place in the Iberian Peninsula uh, from January 2nd forward and was happening already, that would happen later to us um, at following October 12th, 1492. And so that is what I argue and what I'll show with the rest of the presentation, uh, the logic and the practice that many of our communities have been battling and that we're caught up in in particular and living in the United States. Following 1492, the Portuguese and the the and Ar Aragon and Castile, soon to be the Spanish monarchs, but the Catholic monarchs start to fight about the new conquests, the new territories, and the Pope steps in and draws a couple of lines first, you know, um, one in 1493, and then settles on the on the Treaty of Tordesillas, the line from north to south in 1494 that made it so that Spain could uh, invade everything west and Portugal was given dominion to invade everything east. And so we get here why Brazil speaks Portuguese because that was part of the Treaty of Tordesillas' territory and also colonized Africa and uh, had a lot of its imperial business in the Indian Ocean. And then Spain, a lot of the Western part of Aviala, of these lands today called the Americas, speaks Spanish. And what ends up happening eventually, for example, here on these lands is further cutting up. The Treaty of Tordesillas had been the first, the inauguration of borders, uh, the inauguration of global linear thinking, uh, the cutting up of the globe, into property. And so we see this with the vice royalties that were created shortly after uh, Columbus's voyage, the vice royalty of New Spain, which would eventually become Mexico and you know Granada, Rio de la Plata, Peru, and Brazil. And that logic continues on to uh, Africa uh, 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 in the late 19th century after um, Europe is, is cutting itself up at this time, it had just uh, finished creating itself as a collection of nation states as well. Germany had just finished uniting, quote unquote, the, the, the way that um, the creation of a nation state is called along with Italy. And Germany hosts a conference, the Conference of Berlin, the Congo Conference, to cut up Africa because Germany wants to be part of these imperial conquests. And in order to not fight in war with the other imperial powers, which would come eventually uh, with the world wars, they cut up and put up on the map, on the wall, a map of Africa uh, where they decided, Europeans decided amongst themselves who was going to take what and very famously Cecil Rhodes um, wanting all the way to the Nile to Cape Town 
wanting to conquer all of Africa. So there's this moment in the 19th century, especially when colonialism was just about taking everything that you could take. And so when this happens in Africa, just returning to that map, Congo is given as personal property to King Leopold II of Belgium. And he treats it as his own personal rubber plantation. And a lot of this is uh, to treat, I mean, they're to colonize, they're to treat the territory, the land, the people as a plantation. And we eventually then get that happening in the Eastern Mediterranean where the Ottoman Empire had held territory for centuries and was now falling. So with World War I, the Ottoman Empire loses uh, and the British and the French and the Russians and other European powers secretly decide how they're going to cut up those territories. They'd been salivating over them for a while because the, the Ottoman Empire had been declining and there was a lot of anxiety among Europeans with what was going to happen with those territories. How is that going to ch change or alter the power imbalance in Europe with, among the empires? And if you notice there with Palestine, Palestine was going to be under British, French, and Russian protection with a small section near the port of Akka that was going to be just British, just like the area labeled as Kuwait was going to be just British and Iraq, kind of British, Lebanon, fully French, Syria, kind of French, you know? That little piece of Palestine in the port of Akka was meant to connect a pipeline from the Gulf to the Mediterranean to feed Europeans energy. And that has not happened yet um, because Palestinians have been in the way of it by defending their land. But in September of this, this, this year, just a couple of weeks before October 7th, Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, was showing a couple of maps to the UN and one of them was Israel in 1948. It says not showing Palestine, so completely erasing Palestine from the map and saying that Israel has now made peace with so many of its neighbors that the problem is the Palestinians rather than how it's always been understood that the problem is Israel. And then shows this next set of maps of the, uh, shaded in green Egypt, Sudan, Jordan, Bahrain, and also Saudi Arabia. This is the eve of the Saudi Arabia normalization treaty with Israel. Already Egypt, Sudan, Jordan, and Bahrain have normalized Israel, and now Saudi Arabia was about to. And Netanyahu gets a red marker and draws from the Gulf to, uh, to the Aqqa port, that pipeline saying that with, you know, basically with Palestine out of the way, this is going to bring peace to the new Middle East. So uh, imperialism, the imperialism continues from a hundred years before. So just to orient us a little bit more, just to show where we're at, this is Middle East and North Africa. I'm just gonna zoom into that area. And this is borders circa 2000s of North Africa and the Middle East. And just to show the Ottoman Empire a little bit, it didn't have borders. Uh, it had frontiers that overlapped with other empires and the seas were a big part of its territory as well. And those seas were an obsession to the European powers for trading. And in particular, to cut a canal between the Mediterranean and the Red Seas to be able to go to the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> that canal exists today, it's called the Suez Canal but didn't exist back then. The idea was there though. And uh, if we go in here, zooming in a little bit more to look at um, Palestine, uh, that's where Palestine and, this, and the Sinai Peninsula are. This is just to um, highlight the areas where that made the seas very uh, coveted by the European empires for Russia. Um, taking those Ottoman territories is going to be important to be able to have a year-round access to a warm water port through the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And for uh, the French, the French, Napoleon was around at this time in the 1800s, early 1800s. And he, instead of turning his warships to Britain, 
who he really wanted to con he really wanted to defeat. Uh, he turned his warships over to Egypt and brought scientists with him. And they came up, even though they they lost uh, and had to go back to France, they came up with a description of Egypt, which is an epic encyclopedia that Westerners purchased. And they were very touched with by looking at these images and these maps. So the, this became the first uh, scientific map of Palestine, the, the map grid. And um, there's the Nile there. And just zooming in, most of it is Egypt, but the coastal parts here is Gaza, and you can you can see that the coasts were measured and mapped. Uh, this is a this is a navy, so the coasts were important to them. And also, here is another sheet of Palestine. It's called uh, Jerusalem and Jaffa, and it has the coasts mapped pretty accurately. But inside, you can see like the the caterpillar kind of mountains from medieval maps or illustrations that show where Jerusalem is. And the thing is, is that they didn't go to Jerusalem, Napoleon's forces, but they wanted to include Jerusalem because they wanted to appeal to Western Christian sensibilities with the sale of the encyclopedia. And eventually, so this is 18, early 1800s, eventually in this, in this century, in the 19th century, a lot of, uh, particularly evangelical Christians who see these maps and the encyclopedia get inspired and want to go to the Holy Land, as they call it, to map their, their version of Christianity true. And they want to scientifically prove their version of Christianity. And they come up with a map of Western Palestine that they map together with the British imperial engineers under the cover of religion and science while the Ottoman Empire is still there. And they come up with a map of Western Palestine uh, after having followed particularly the book of Joshua to get the, the, the geographical extent of the promised land, which extends beyond the River Jordan, which is the Eastern boundary of Western Palestine. And a really interesting just accident of history. It's a map of Western Palestine. The map of Eastern Palestine uh, was supposed to be mapped by the Americans. The map of Western Palestine was mapped by the British. And the Americans were not very good cartographers. And so the British told him, OK, you can map, but take the Eastern part. Because you know, for them, the Western part had the more important site. And it did turn out that the American cartographers messed up and did not map the Eastern portion, which is why that iconic shape today that we know of as Palestine um, is that way and doesn't extend out to, you know, beyond to Jordan. And so eventually after the Ottoman Empire falls with the help of this map, which the British military created and it has all of the roads and the wells and, you know, through the cover of religion, uh, they um, cut up those that iconic Palestine shape. In 1923, it was between the, the British and the French. And again, this is a logic of borders being contracts between European imperial powers, not discussions with people on the ground, with communities on the ground about how these borders will affect their lives. They're really just territories to be administered kind of like a what's called a god trick from above and so eventually um with with the atrocities the nazis committed on jews there's already a movement to create a homeland for jews zionism that is a movement political zionism the creation of a nation state for jews is a movement that got started at around the time when it was starting within Europe itself and Jews found themselves not fitting into this idea of what the nation was, of who was French or who was German, or who was Russian. And so the Zionist movement grew wanting to be able to get a nation state for Jews where Jews could be a majority. And initially uh, was very secular Theodore Herzl, the father of political Zionism, was very secular and was even looking for a place in Africa during that whole scramble 
for Africa was looking for maybe a state for Jews in Uganda. Very much a, an imperial mindset, very much speaking with the other imperial powers about a solution to the Jewish question. And so the United Nations, which is created right after World War II, it partitions Palestine to create a homeland for Jews and the assumption is that all of the Arabs who are living there will leave and move to what will be created as an Arab state. And so there's this um, population transfer that's planned, which would, had, already, had, had also, also taken place in India, between India and Pakistan. And also around this time, apartheid was being implemented in 1948. It was implemented formally in South Africa. So the, to be a part, to do population transfer was very much the idea at the time. And it still is for some people, although not for many. So because the native Palestinian population rejects this plan and the neighboring Arab countries support that rejection, they go to war with uh, the, new, the Zionist militias who are backed by the Europeans and they win, the Europeans win and Israel is created. Um, Israel is created um, and no Arab state is created. Instead, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank are created as places where refugees go. Um, and after a couple of decades, there's another war, 1967, which Israel likes to call the Six Day War, a uh, very biblical uh, terminology. And the Sinai Peninsula becomes occupied, so does Gaza, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. What's important to know about when Israel was created was that a lot of Palestinians fled their homes because it was a situation of war and they fully expected to come back. And Israel did not let them come back because Israel understood that as a demographic miracle where now there was a majority of Jews there and not non-Jews. And so a lot of the refugees that lived on the coast, for example, they got penned in to the Gaza Strip after they had fled there for safety. And they've been there for 75 years. And in the West Bank, West Bank of the River Jordan, that territory has a lot of refugee camps and refugees have been there for 75 years as well. And there's refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. And there's diaspora all over the world as well. Um, with this war in 1967, the Golan Heights from Syria was, al was also occupied. Uh, and the idea uh, was land for peace, to trade land for peace with the Sinai Peninsula, which is what happened with the Camp David Treaty in 1979. Egypt did not, um, e Egypt was neutralized from, the, from Israel, Palestine, from supporting the Palestinians in this way. And so then we get the peace process of Oslo of 1993, the two-state solution. And a lot of this conversation has been or a huge impasse for the last 30 years because Israel continues to, cre to create more and more settlements in the West Bank, which is supposed to be part of a Palestinian state. And uh, the, the situation ends up looking like this very iconic panel that maybe many have seen, but it's very prominent in the narrative of the Palestinians. And it's also very similar to here, to the United States. And uh, what we see is just dispossession over dispossession. And that's actually something that I learned most when I lived in Palestine, when I would visit uh, Israeli places like a mall, for example, it reminded me so much of the subjectivity, the ways of being here in the United States where people are just making their lives as settlers uh, with a lot of blood under their feet. And many don't like to talk about it. Many don't know it. A lot of the educational system is not very good about talking about it and even tries to police uh, educators who want to talk about it. And so really what, what, what I argue about borders then and why there has been an impasse, why this two-state solution, for example, will never happen in addition to the Israel creating facts on the ground is that it will never happen as long as Palestinians are not understood to be human beings, 
to be equal human beings to Israelis. And so that's why I want to come here because the world of 1492 created borders, but it really created a foundation as well. It created a foundation of non-Europe that where Europe was able to be built. And so the borders, nation state borders, um, take their, their contracts between those above in this realm above, which traditionally was very much, uh, it was very clear Europe, non-Europe under colonialism, under formal colonialism, but with the uh, decolonization movements of the 20th century, the United Nations, the world shifted to a world of universal human equality or decolonization. But even though the Europe and the non-Europe labels uh, are no longer used like that, human is used that way. And, and what's assumed is that there exists as a non-human, which is sometimes called a terrorist, sometimes called a communist, sometimes called an anarchist. Just anyone that is dehumanized in order for this idea of the human. And there's a lot to talk about in terms of that idea of, of who qualifies as human. Um, and this is a logic and practice that is very common in our world, in this dominant world. So for example, with the nation state, the citizen uh, is superior to the non-citizen in terms of rights. So this is not just positions, these are positions of power where one is superior and one is inferior. And sadly, in the context of Israel, Jews are above and non-Jews are below. So there's a foundation that the state of Israel um, needs, requires as necessary, and those are the Palestinians because of the logic of empire is to go above in order to not be below. Below is the place of death and destruction and annihilation for many. So when we come back to the yes, Marcos is gay, communique, notice that in context, Marcos is a Palestinian in Israel and a Jew in Germany. So the context shifts. And so if we look at how this plays out in everyday life, just in, in 2021, Israel des designated six Palestinian human rights groups as terrorist organizations. And they were organizations that did research and development that worked on, on rights, on law, women, children, prisoners, and farmers. And so to come back here too, though, like this is a global logic. This is a world logic. It's not just about Israel. And that's something that I, I I always wanna argue, this is not just about Zionism, this is about empire. And the way that it looks right now is that it is white supremacist with white uh, as superior and non-white as inferior. It's also anti-black, anti-blackness being the opposite pole of whiteness. So those of us who can't be white, the assumption is, well, at least we should not be black because that's the below. So non-black is superior to black in a context of anti-blackness. In a context of patriarchy, the male is above over the non-male. Under capital, value is above over non-value. And what's important to know about this above and below configuration is that it's a closed system. It, 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 they need each other. The below, well, the above needs the below. If the below were to leave, like a master-slave relationship, if the slave were to escape, there would be no master because the master needs a slave in order to be master, otherwise a master would just be a regular person. And so what happens a lot of the time with those of us below, and a lot of us have found ourselves in below according to context shifts. Um, personally, my, my the discourse that I've been around a lot is of assimilation, is that we should assimilate into being American. So that means going from the below to the above, but it still requires a below. It doesn't disrupt the idea that there is a below that's being crushed so that the above can make their lives. And that's not troubled enough. Uh, and I am very always very grateful when we do trouble it. And also very grateful when we talk about escape, flight, marunaj, which is a lot from the black radical tradition, this idea of instead of trying to be the master, instead of the slave, how about we just flee? and we will create other communities. And we have different relationships like side by side, for example, rather than above and below. I wanna, I wanna end there uh, so we can have discussion because um, this is a framework that I, 
I've realized I've, I've borrowed it a lot from the Zapatistas and from the Black radical tradition and from my experience with Palestine and Israel. And especially that I had to learn while living in Palestine, in Bethlehem, that I had to learn how to how to relate to to religions that were not mine. So how to relate to the Christian community that were my neighbors and the Muslim community that were my neighbors and Jews. How do I relate to different worlds? And and I re I've been realizing that instead of, for example, understanding a world as inherently one way, so like for example, a lot of us, Christianity, that's a very triggering faith because of the colonial history that a lot of it accompanies. And so, I'm, but, you know, meeting folks like you all, like Chad, Elaine, Tim, Dave, like the, the more radical community that is really about um, liberation, and also that the Zapatistas themselves, many of them come from a liberation theology background, where you can read a lot of their political flows of power and their organization, like through a lot of the songs for and, and the prayers. For example, one of them that I always remember is a prayer that, that says, Do, we, sh we must not crush others and we must not crush ourselves. And so just the, the, the crushing that power from above down to the below is something that they try to ward away from. And they try to then nurture a more egalitarian, uh, way of power flowing while while people can remain different instead of trying to be the same, like the above and below configuration of assimilation, trying to be the same as the standard that is set. So I've been thinking a lot about this question of liberation in all of our worlds. I work a lot toward the idea of building a world where many worlds fit rather than just a world where we can all live. I feel like we need to be specific that Yes, let's all live, but not as the same, you know, as ourselves, as, as our different communities that we are. Um, because with the so-called Cold War, which is really the Third World War, the, the, the choices, the options were either the first world or the second world, and you have to pick a world. Well, how about, you know, a world where there's lots of other worlds? Can we, can we do that instead? And can we make it so that instead of having to seek our oppressor's permission to survive, right? We can figure out ways to be safe together, to create a world where we're not going to genocide, ethnically cleanse, where that's not necessary, where the enemy is just a mystery and not an enemy, I'm sorry, where the stranger is just a mystery and, and not an enemy right away. So in, in a world where many worlds fit, I've come to recognize that, religions are worlds, religions are worlds, and how are we going to fit many worlds together? And I've, in trying to learn about other worlds, I've noticed similar tensions that exist within faith communities that also exist within movement organizing communities that may not understand themselves as faith communities, but maybe as secular. And it's these, this tension between that freedom and that security um, that that move toward res the respect of difference and that conformity, that uniformity. So when I think about Palestine today and I, and I think about our Jewish relatives, I feel like we need to talk about liberation more because Israel itself did not resolve the question of liberation for our Jewish relatives at all. It gave them a sense of safety, which has been really shaken now. But in terms of liberation, that's that's a whole other project. And if we can not assume that Israel is a solution or a liberatory project, I think that it can get us into more interesting, more liberatory, obviously, conversations that are really necessary. And I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Kiki. Um, Chen Elaine, do you have some questions to jump in here with and continue the conversation? Also invite people to put things in the chat. I've started off some thoughts in there as well.
Oh, thank you, Kiki. That was just, that was amazing. Thank you. Uh, starting with your comment about how, how you became fascinated uh, with this, uh, starting with border crossings and then seeing those maps that, uh, that uh, was really, really visually so powerful to get us, get our heads around this conversation. And I, you know, where I will start is just, just a quick reflection on, on what you said um, just at the end there um, about this is not um, how, how Jews are living in Israel is not a liberated state. And Chad and I got to be um, in Palestine, Israel in 2011. And um, for me, the painful pieces of seeing particularly young Jewish women who were armed um, and how they treated uh, Palestinian elderly men and women and children or any Palestinians and just, you know, that um, absolute power and domination, and I just felt for those young Jewish women, what is that doing to you? That's destroying those young Jewish people. And there is such a unhealth um, in there. So that, you know, your uh, description of, of um, your presentation that you gave us just brought um, that uh, back to life for me. And, you know, and as I said at the beginning, I mean, the same things, the maps that you you showed of Palestinians being dispossessed, the same um, dispossession that happened here um, on Canadian and, and U.S. soil and how Indigenous folks here uh, own uh, now have zero 0.02% of um, the land of both Canada and the United States is now uh, indigenous reserves or reservations. Um, so I am coming up with a question, but I just, all of this is bubbling um, and resonating, but I know um, Chad has a question. So <laughs> let me think for a moment, um, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks Kiki for, um the way in which you uh, can help uh, us visualize um, <clears throat> a history which we've been educated and socialized to be ignorant about. Um, you know, the old adage that uh, war is uh, how U.S. citizens learn world geography uh, because we have to figure out, oh, where's Grenada? Where's Iraq? Mm. You know, where where's <clears throat> uh, Ukraine? And, um, and I'm thinking about uh, you talking about borders um, as, um, I guess I'd paraphrase it, borders are the architecture of imperial management. Um, and you've you've kind of really beautifully demonstrated how how that works. And and I think that these uh, you know mapping as pedagogy is really really helps um, all of us who are still woefully illiterate in the history of conquest and empire all over the world. Um, it helps take that out of the abstract. Um, wh when we think of things as abstract, then they're easily disappeared. Um, borders, uh, particularly um, the genealogy of borders, watching how they shift under imperial mm -hmm. um, competition and um, contest really um, helps, uh, well, it, it challenges us to learn these histories, to, to, to not live with this agnosia uh, about how things came to be, how these borders happened. Um, <clears throat> the, the downside of, 
of um, putting too much emphasis on borders, political borders, even as they um, evolve, is that they get stuck and and reified in our mind as as actual things. I uh, remember growing up um, in the fifties, and I had this really cool puzzle mm-hmm. of North America. And each puzzle piece was the shape of a state or a province, and they all had different colors. And I, I'm, I must have done that puzzle, you know, hundreds of times. I love that puzzle. That's that's how I first learned about Saskatchewan. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I, I, I find this this resonance with your work in in the work that we've done on watershed discipleship. That mm. how do we um, once we recognize the violence of imperial borders, how do we unreify them in our imaginations? Um, and what is our alternative? And so, you know, we've we've been suggesting that bioregional boundaries or ways of mapping watershed ways of mapping are um, much less inherently um, non-imperial. Um, but that's that's kind of an over the horizon thing for most folks because we literally have been um, <clears throat> uh, shaped by our ideas of of boundaries. Um, I love your your phrase. You know the you know there's so much blood under the feet mm-hmm. of these of these um, boundaries and um, the other great <laughs> resonance that that we feel with your presentation is that. These borders, these imperial maps, um, and the histories behind them, um, the the borders are in a way the um, the architecture of what we call haunted history. Um, these these histories of genocide, these histories of disappearance, um, and so in in your mind, as you because you're focused on on borders, and I, I just love the big picture that you've given us. Um, once folks do learn the history, which is so important, um, how does, um, do, do we continue to think uh, in a new imaginary of something like borders? Um, or how do we map? How do we map things? And I, I know you've done a lot of thinking about about that. What, what do maps of... Um, you know, of a liberated world um, look like? What do, what do they take as um, as contours and um, entry and, and exit points and so on? Have you, have you, have you thought, thought some about that? Because I don't want folk to get the sense that um, you're, you're really wed to the kinds of borders that you're teaching us about. You're actually teaching us about them in order to deconstruct them, right? <clears throat> Yeah, I'm I'm happy to share a little bit about that, if I may, just very quickly. Um, How do we map? So a very colonial border oftentimes is taken up as a counter map of the resistance. So here's a poster in in the 1960s of the map of Palestine, and it has armed struggle and everyday life. The map was also taken up by the political parties. That's Fatah, and the map is in the back. And that the bottom one is the Marxist one, the Marxist party that emphasizes the return of the refugees. Uh, Yasser Arafat used to wear his kafiya as a map. Um, and there's also this, um, this is Google Earth. When Google Earth first came out, Google Earth um, is, is a platform where you can create a layer of pins to tell a story. And a Palestinian refugee created a pin for the villages destroyed by Israel in order to be created as a state. And that's area, that's territory that the Palestinian leadership doesn't map um, because of the two-state solution, they're constricted to the West Bank and Gaza. And this map made a huge noise, a bigger noise than anything that the leadership could do. And I wrote about it because the, the, the great paradox that this is hyper surveillance of military software of Cold War era the satellites and still like it was able to be turned against it against empire 
by the below. And that's um, something that I found out a lot, like going into refugee camps, for example, you see only the map of Palestine, not of Gaza and the West Bank, but all of it. And this has the a list of the villages that Palestinians in that camp are from. There's after a while, I started seeing the map of Palestine everywhere. So that one is kind of like in the middle. In the middle, it says Palestine. And so I went around the camp and I just looked at all the graffiti, the graffiti maps of the camp, and I made a map of maps. And something that um, I was trying to do in this work, because I had this problem with maps, exactly like you're saying, Chad, like, how do we map? And I was in, a, in this refugee camp, uh, teaching art to little kids so that they could teach me they could speak to me in Arabic and I could learn more and when they learned that I can make maps they asked me to map the camp and we got into this whole conversation about the dangers of mapping and why we shouldn't map but they said well Israel already has the maps to the camp and when they raid us they take us into their vehicle and they show us the name of our family name uh, on the building that we live in. So Israel has a maps, but the refugees don't. So they asked me to map and I was able to get a, a high resolution aerial photograph and trace. Now this is, I had a refugee camp that has the the wall and the sniper towers right next to it. And it's in Bethlehem. And so Jerusalem is just five miles looking forward in, in that direction. And so as, as I was mapping, I, I asked about my streets, are the streets, uh, are, are they accurate? Um, because the camp is so crowded and me mapping from below, from above, like I hardly know the camp. So I asked a compa of mine who's from the camp, like, are the streets right? And he said, yeah, they are, but you know, the rooftops are also streets. And so he mapped the rooftops as streets. And this is a map of oh, the, the second intifada when they are under curfew yeah. and not allowed to go on the streets. They have to jump roof to roof. You want to get mushrooms? Yeah. And, and all of that. So I didn't get her. I have thought about the uh, how do we map? And it was Palestinians themselves who taught me that the map itself is not a problem. It's how you deploy it strategically. Um, so they, they show that with Google Earth, they show that with the entire colonial outline of Palestine. And so I think that a, an answer is that, yeah, we should have education about how these borders were built and you know imperial geographic imaginations. And then once we do, I think that we'll have a lot more ideas, just like how you're bringing that up, Chet, about mapping the watershed rather than like even just that as a, an alternative, it really gets a lot of gears moving, you know, and, and those kinds of alternatives kind of give people permission to just think about bigger things and not have to be just confounded or, or, or relegated to the given geography, which is why I like showing that sacred map of, Pal of Jerusalem, sacred geography versus the, Car the Cartesian one of the state of Palestine. Not that there's one that's better than the other. It's just that when one's more hegemonic, we lose a lot uh, that other maps could be telling us. Uh, there's two questions, from, one from Diana. Thank you, Kiki. And did I understand correctly that Netanyahu is on record somewhere as having said a pipeline will be built through Gaza things? You know, I have heard something like that, but I can't, um, I can't say much, but it looks like someone has shared, uh, yeah, something about another canal, the Ben Gurion Canal, um, and these other these mega projects that are in um, in the plans. And Camilo asks, is liber liberation from the imperialist project that created the Israel Palestine confound possible without liberation from the capitalist project, particularly as it is driven by energy material growth through fossil fuel and mineral extraction? I don't think it's possible. That's a, that's the que that's a great question. Is liberation possible without liberation from capitalism? Like capitalism itself shares that same uh, logic and practice about an above and below where the above is the human and the below is the non-human, which is, you know, traditionally, sadly, for empire has been 
Mother Earth or anything that is, you know, really closer to Earth, whether it's Native American people, African people, or just anyone non quote unquote civilized. So capitalism actually uh, has that as its foundation, that above and below human, non-human, um, and not just human, non-human, but value, non-value. And so I, I don't see how it could be possible to achieve liberation without liberation from capital as well. And another um, comment, so happy to be here. I discovered you Kiki in a comment thread on Instagram last night. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And we're so excited to see your words and then visit your website to read more. I am a rare lucky one to have had the chance to live in non-equity cooperative housing in Toronto. And I believe that this model could be a key path to communities not relying on people, on people in power to give us permission to step away from the above below structure we are so stuck in, in regular society. Yeah, yeah these everyday life, new ways of being, of living, that, you know, it's not just ideology, it's, it's a way of being in the world. And it means how are we gonna relate to someone who's not me, somebody who's different from me? How am I gonna share the world? How are we gonna share the world together with difference? That theoretically sounds great. It's in practice, though, that we need to figure out how we're going to do it, especially if we've been raised in a society that doesn't do it, that defaults to the above and the below. So, yeah, all of these examples of uh, cooperative housing, cooperative work, just cooperation, just things that are bigger than just an individual, um, where individuality is allowed because the collective respects difference so much. It's about like, everyone in our beautiful difference being who we are for a greater collective project is what allows that. So getting away from the autonomy of the individual and to autonomy, you know, of communities and, you know, and, and more concretely as we're talking right now about, we need a general strike so we can stop this genocide. We can get people to listen to us. When we think about that, we need to be able to sustain a general strike, like the Montgomery bus boycott, for example, was effective because alternative transportation was organized. It wasn't just about rejecting it. It was about creating something else too. So autonomous community projects, any, any way that we can need this world of above and below less because, and this is what I think is so beautiful about your book, Jed and Elaine, that when we recognize that context shifts us from above and below according to where we're at and what the measures of value are for a given society, like there's a structure there. And I think that it makes it easier for us to have that really difficult internal struggle because so much of the world wants to tell us that we're either good or evil uh, just inherently, you know, rather than how structures of society give us options and some of them are really horrible options mm -hmm. and when it comes to survival if we're below a lot of the time we can have some some of the most beautiful human creativity take place and also some of the worst destructive human human practice take place right with this question of survival so how do we move over to the one that creates and doesn't destroy that's really i think the question for all of our worlds mm. Thank you, Kiki. And you know, I am wondering, I know we saw earlier um, that Sarah and Jonathan Nahar uh, were on the call and they might be busy with Baby Belen. So I don't want to assume you are available, but these two beautiful friends and colleagues are brilliant political thinkers and have been involved in Palestine and many, many struggles um, for justice. And so Sarah and Jonathan, I'm I'm throwing it up right now and wondering, I, I would love for you to also, we would love for you to uh, engage with what Kiki um, is bringing here or just offering your own own uh, perspective as our uh, brilliant political minds that you are. Are you here? <laughs> oh, they're here, yay. And they're oh, brilliant. They're... <laughs> Sweetheart. <laughs> you are awake. <laughs> we are all so excited about this conversation that we can't go to sleep. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, there were, yeah, so 
thank you for the opportunity because I had a few things and I was like, how do I make this into a question? Because <laughs> as my mind spinning uh, with, with some of the work that I've done, particularly around Christian Zionism um, in the ways that, you know, you talked about the, the mapping that, that British Christians were doing of, of all of the, the sites to kind of do it for themselves. And then that gets tied into a, a theology of domination uh, as well. And so uh, in, in two days, I'm going to be presenting on the doctrine of discovery and Palestine. Um, and so very similar um, ideas to, to what you were sharing there. Um, so really deeply uh, appreciated that. Now I can't think of the second thing that I was going to share as well. But um, yeah, just really appreciate your work with uh, thinking about how how mapping uh, like the colonization of mapping. And it reminds me of when I, I was in Palestine, I worked in um, Hebron Al-Khalil on the South Hebron Hills with community peacemaker teams, uh, what was then called Christian peacemaker teams. And um, I think of the village of Atwani, that is one that we worked in where uh, it's one of the most beautiful examples I know of, of like a community coming together for uh, nonviolent resistance to colonialism. Um, and it's a village where like most of the uh, buildings, including the schools, including wells, had demolition orders on them. Um, and one of the things that one of the tools that they used was getting a master plan, getting an official map that they could get through the colonial uh, Israeli uh, channels uh, in order to protect uh, those buildings. And that was that was a successful strategy that they had and thinking about how you you were talking about uh how maps you know it's how you use them right uh and so uh, that was just one way where i saw uh maps within the work that palestinians were doing to hold on to their land to challenge the colonization and the displacement that was going on uh around around palestinians there um and yeah, just one of the many ways that we Palestinians are are struggling um, against colon colonization today. So thank you. Really have appreciated thinking about about maps in this way and the connections from 1492. Thank I'd you. like to read my own my own comment here, just building on what Jonathan you said. One of the connections that I wasn't familiar with before was how the early cartographers you described. Kiki were had in mind a Christian audience from the very beginning of that of that mapping and how that Christian gaze still certainly heavily shapes U.S. foreign policy um, from that from that Zionist lens and that that thread being there from the beginning is really good to understand. I was going to ask you, Jonathan, and thank you for your your thoughts. If you if you don't mind sharing. Is if your talk will be public or not? If we could, if we might attend. <laughs> it's at a it's at a conference uh, here in uh, Syracuse, New York, Onondaga Land, the Doctrine of Discovery Conference. Oh, okay. Organized by the Indigenous Values Initiative. Uh, and so I don't think that they will have recordings this year, but. Um, there, there might be audio and it's based on a blog that I put on their website. So I'll, I'll try to find that and put it on the chat now. In the chat, someone's asking about the book. So yeah, Healing Haunted Histories. I think I mentioned it because I think it's so important. I haven't finished reading it. It's a very big book that should be read in community, just like it suggests. <laughs> um, but the parts that I have, I, I just I'm I'm fine. I'm so grateful for it these days because something that I feel we really need to do more of is offer each other a way out, you know, offer ourselves a way out of of the settler subjectivity of the above position, right? What is the the tunnel out to the maroon, to the maroonage, to the escape, to the Right. And, and we need a lot of compassion for that self-compassion. And we need a lot of community for that. Um, that's going to tell us that it's going to be okay. I think um, a lot of 
forgiveness. And I think that recognizing that we're in a structure that we didn't invent, you know, that we didn't create, but has been created for us. And we can create other structures. What other structures can we create that can nurture those really beautiful human capacities for creation rather than for destruction? So very grateful for it, for that work. I, I'd like to... Um... <clears throat> Talk a little bit about one of your favorite topics, um, Marunaj. Um, you know, with you, you took us way back to the 1490s, and of course, one of the linchpins of 1492 was the Edict of Banishment of uh, <clears throat> Jews and Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula. And many of those Jews, of course, um, uh, escaped to Africa and elsewhere or, or east, but many of them came to the Americas um, with the early um, voyages and did so often uh, surviving as um, crypto Jews or, you know, mm -hmm. um, presenting themselves as, as Christians. And many of those people um, came to, to Mexico and then came up from there to the frontera, escaping the Inquisition when the Inquisition came to Mexico and uh, <clears throat> settled in New Mexico, as, as you know, and, um, you know, they were, they were often called Marranos, you know, which is that, that uh, iteration of, of Marunage. Um, and, and so there's these deep historical pockets from um, black and indigenous people in the great dismal swamp in, in North Carolina or um, <clears throat> the crypto Jews in Northern New Mexico, who, who uh, some of whom are just now in this generation coming out of the closet um, 400 years later. But we live in a world where um, places to go, marginal areas, um, are harder and harder to find, particularly as uh, extractive corporations go into the deepest wildernesses um, to extract stuff. Um, <clears throat> and so they're, they're sort of already there. <laughs> um, so what, is, what does uh, Marunaj mean for um, our alternative communities when they're they're no longer geographically specific necessarily. Um, uh, that is, they're not able to seek out land apart, um, but creating these little, what you call autonomous zones, you know, in the midst of, of empire. I think that's what we're looking at uh, by and large from here on out. Yeah, the question is, um, is it possible to maroon in place? You know, especially if... <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. good mm -hmm. well, because maroonage is really about new social relations new ways of treating each other and and our and all life it is really hard when we are urban and especially more and more as you're mentioning chad like a lot of extractivism is still taking place where more and more people are being forced to live in cities with, oh. and, and which then makes us um captive to capital like, I don't know, like, I'm very uh, anti-capitalist, but in my everyday life, it's very hard to be anti, to not live with, cap, you know, to not live with capitalism. And it's something that I've, I've only really realized and in community when I'm in Chiapas or in Palestine, when there, where there is land, like how land is the condition of possibility for another world. So if we don't have access to land, how do we build that other world? And you know, for me being urban um, and the, the compas that I organize with were all urban, like we, we're trying to have a foot in each and try to figure out, you know, as we're building out a, a new territory in the mountains and we're in, in relation with the original native peoples who are stewarding that land, even if they may not really want something to do with it right now, like it's really important for us to maintain that, that invitation always. Uh, we're in the mountains and we're also in the city and something that we're trying to work on a lot um, is the justice question, the community justice question, because even folks who have a lot of land, like in the Zad in France, for example, was um, able to visit there when the Zapatistas were there in 2021 for an encounter. And they have a lot of land and they have farms and they have, you know, their workshops and their schools and their homes. and but they say they can't figure out the community justice question yet. And that's something I think we can work on anywhere. And, and indeed we must work on 
anywhere where we live, whether we have access to land or not. But I do think that the the Maroonish question and the land question need to go together and we need to figure out creative ways to do that. Because if we don't have land as a condition of possibility for another way, we're not gonna be able to live without capitalism. We're not gonna be able to do a general strike. We're not gonna be able to truly build autonomy and live in right relation with others. Because as long as we're subject to living our lives through capitalism, we're going to be above. There's going to be a below always that we're crushing, whether it's Mother Earth or whether it's other peoples who are being dispossessed from their lands, whether the Congo, it's everywhere. So Always Coming Home, Ursula de Guin is a brilliant radical novel that I return to the message that's part of my brain. Uh, I'm gonna write that down, reimagining what society might look like. Thank you, Tina. I'm a terrible speller. It's supposed to be massage. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> massage. Yeah, and the Christian Zionism question, um, I was really surprised about that too. But then after a while, I wasn't so surprised. Um, Napoleon himself, had the idea of Jews coming to Palestine, which would be very helpful for him as he's trying to cut the canal, the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. um, so Christian Zionism has been very much, um, even before Jewish Zionism, political Jewish Zionism arose in the 19th century, it was its precursor. And shout out to Northeast farmers of color who are working on this question. And oh, there's a, Nepo Land Trust and Movement Generation. Thank you. We have a land trust I work with here. Um, so I'm going to look into these materials after. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to say a word about these two things that you put in the chat? Sure, I can. Yeah. Well, Jonathan and I trade off a lot of different roles with Belen, but <laughs> I do the majority of the breastfeeding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The majority. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, wonderful to be with you. Yeah, community. I guess I'll speak to Marunage and the Convivencia. So sometimes when I was living in Argentina, they talked a lot about uh, just celebrating October 11, 1492 and, and beforehand. So like looking towards 1491 and before. So like, what were we doing? What was working? Okay, yes things got taken over, but what can we still yet remember? Mm -hmm. And as, as a member of various religious communities, my root tradition being Mennonite Christian, this idea that that religions are, are, are long social movements that have memories that are sticky and powerful. And uh, as you all articulate song lines, bloodlines, land lines, these lines of communication. And so uh, as you were speaking about being urban or being in negotiation with these various capitalist entities, I think about when I'm leaning in to work with others, I'm working towards that idea of convivencia, which is what was going on in Andalusia before uh, 1492, right, where Muslims, Christians, and Jews, and others uh, were, were finding ways to, to share this planet. And they really got into each other's texts and traditions and like would nerd out with each other, right? And so uh, that that vibration of, of trying to be a scholar activist uh, is how I engage when, I, when I'm with a lot. And I think that the practice of Sabbath and, and times of rest uh, are like many spaces of oasis. And so, you know, as Trisha Hearsey of the Nat Ministry would say, like, rest is, rest is political, you know, your body doesn't belong to capitalism. This is really important for Black folks because in many ways, our, our land is our bodies, right? The way that we were moved around was all, almost as mobile land, you know, taken from the place that we were a part of to another place, you know, and, 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 and used in a particular way. And, you know, cause you know, in so many ways, as Kelly Hayes would say, white supremacy works on us and exploitation. It works on indigenous people through erasure. And even though those are different ways of working, um, the impacts of environmental racism and things of that nature through anti-blackness, if you analyze black bodies as land themselves, land ourselves, it's, it's, it, can, it can start to help make sense. 
And that's another way of seeing borders, like segregation as bordering, you know, because it's where that wherever that land moves, all, the, all of a sudden the borders move and 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 the glass ceilings and, and the not so glass walls. And and so those times of maroonage and those times of saying, I'm going to rest, or I'm going to move slow. Those are also um, as available as our support structures make them. And so creating such structures of support has been really fun as well um, to, to think about. Um, as we seek to map the historic future. It's past our bedtime, so that was a ramble, but if it was incoherent, then that's great too, because incoherence is another way to get out of capitalism. <laughs> you can't market that. That's right. Uh, Kiki, I hope I hope some of us are listening to this notion of rest as maroonage. Yes, <laughs> yes thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Just just a, a quick note about this incredible um, moment on the Iberian Peninsula of Convivencia. Um, there is a text that's been just now is getting recovered and translated that was a Sufi text mm. that was um, recovered by Jews and curated by Jews and then translated with the help of Christian translators all during this period, 13th, 14th century, um, and it's just recently been um, re revived and retranslated by some Jewish and Christian uh, and Muslim scholars. Um, <clears throat> your, your, your comment geeking out on each other's texts is what uh, uh, got me going on this, uh, Sarah. And it's called the, the Animals Lawsuit oh, yeah. Against Humanity. And it's this incredible old, yeah, yeah I'm going to send you a copy. It's 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 incredible, uh, and and it's this, you know, it's this deep wisdom of you know creation kind of rising up to prosecute human abuse, right? In in high medieval times, and yet here's a text that was really curated by, you know, the the three Abrahamic religions, and you know, if if we can at least start um, getting back to some of that synergy, you know, there there's very very little hope. So. Uh, to, and yet, Sarah, isn't it true that most, you know, most folks in North America don't know anything about the history of the Iberian Peninsula? That's why I really appreciated you and appreciate, um, Kiki, you going back to 1492 and saying, all right, so what was going on and how how were the seeds of destruction, but also the seeds of resistance being planted already at, you know, five centuries ago? Mm -hmm. How are we doing on time, Tim? We got five minutes left. Kiki, I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts and then I'll hand it to Chen Elaine to close us out. I do want to say the question about the recording, our plan, it, we, this has been recorded and my plan is either tonight or tomorrow morning to try to send this out to all, everyone who is registered. So you, you should have something you can download and share from tonight. Yeah, just briefly, um, just one key takeaway is something that I learned about particularly from the Zionist movement, is how easy and seductive it is uh, to ask our oppressors for, for safety. Like, you know, there's a saying that you're either at the table or you're on the menu. It's like this either or dog eat dog. Like the assumption is that it's either this or that. And as long as we keep believing that that's true, it's going to make sense that we're going to go above to crush others. And, you know, I see it not just in the Jewish liberation movement, but in so many all of our liberation movements that I know of have this tension. So um, what you just mentioned, what you just shared, Chad, about that book, Animals, Lawsuit Against Humanity. Yeah, if we can do that more, exactly. If we could work together with, with different worlds and respecting each other's worlds, like, I think we all could use a lot of models like that to to let us know that it can be possible. It's not just this utopian kind of thinking. So thank you for that. Jen Elaine, do you wanna close us out? Uh, just so much gratitude. Um, first of all, Tim, to the effort you've put in curating this, making it happen getting getting folk online um <clears throat> kiki 
uh, sharing your beautiful gift of big picture thinking. Yes. This is something we need so profoundly in our movements. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our movements oftentimes are very myopic. We're, we're just head down looking at the immediate issues, not seeing the deep roots. Um, and uh, and this the, these sorts of, is a different kind of breathing space where we can say, oh, yeah, this is the this is the story that we're in of empire, but our stories of resistance and um, resilience are older than that. And so it it really invites us on, at both levels to become more literate in um, <clears throat> the world making of empire and the destruction that that's been so that we don't think that these are the first uh, times folk are struggling with these issues. And we, we know the complex and deep roots of settler colonialism and um, so on, but also drawing more deeply on um, uh, what Sarah said, that, you know, religion is a long story of memory uh, about um, how to be human. Um, whether that's um, by fleeing to the wilderness like the uh, ancient prophets or by marooning in place. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, so just thanks for all yeah. the ways that this um, presentation and your work and witness, Kiki, um, <clears throat> uh, inspires and, and feeds us along the way. And thanks thanks to everybody on this, uh, what is it, Thursday night? Mm -hmm. Um in the midst of Advent, uh, to especially those of you back east, staying up late, we really appreciate it. Um, thanks, thanks for coming into the circle. And I just want to say too, I mean, and I know we all know this, but when we get to when we get to come together like this, and Kiki, you have called us together. You remind us of who we are and who we are together in our struggle against all um, that is facing us. And so, thank you. Uh, for the life that you have lived and continue to live um, for justice that gathers us around you and strengthens all of us because um, together, of course, we are so much stronger um, and for the inspiration that you spread um, throughout us today. And we hope you feel um, some of that back. And I look forward to continuing um, this conversation when, you when's your book, when's your book coming Kiki? out? Oh, February 12th from Wild Ox Press, which is a community autonomous press from Oxnard. All the wild ones in Oxnard. <laughs> yes, so friends on this call, be aware that this book is coming um, and all these beautiful maps are in there and I've heard they're in color. So in that's color. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Kiki. Thanks, everybody. And uh, one plug, since Chen since you didn't do it, I want to make show public the bottom ask Kinther institute for those who are interested i'll put a little link in here this is a gathering that chad and elaine host every year um there's one coming up in february right around the time kiki's book is coming out actually so i'm dropping a link book party book party do it in, uh, in the chat here for those who are interested yeah thanks tim. thank you very much tim yes we're looking at decolonization and sabbath economics capital and how we actually can find practical strategies for reparations and repatriation. That is a central theme of what we are working on. Um, so please uh, check it out. Thank you, Tim. Um, and join us if you are able. Thanks so much. Let's keep these conversations going, yes. friends. Do it. Thank, Thank you. you. Everyone. Bye. Bye everybody. Thank you, Thank you all for coming.